To begin by reading some verses from Paul's letter to the Philippians, well-known verses that we find in chapter 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, let's join in prayer together. O oh Lord, we thank thee for the record of the humiliation of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, the eternal and all-glorious Son of God, who became a man, and having become a man, humbled himself and became obedient, and obedient even to the extent of going to the cross of Calvary to fulfil the Father's good pleasure, to accomplish the salvation of his beloved people. O oh Lord, we thank thee for this great and glorious truth. And it's because of him that we can come to thee tonight. It's because of him that we can come without dread and without fear. It's because of him that we can come and call thee our Father, which art in heaven. And we ask, O oh Lord, that as we come in his name, thou wilt be pleased to receive our worship and to grant a blessing upon us. Lord, we come then and ask these masses, and seek thy face together, and pray as well for the forgiveness of all our sin, that thou wilt cleanse us afresh in that blood shed by the Saviour upon the cross of Calvary. O Lord, help us even in this coming hour to know of a certainty that we are thy people, blood-bought people, beloved people, beloved people of the living God. O Lord, warm our hearts then, and help us in this time of worship as we ask all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Now I'm going to read a hymn from Psalms and Hymns of Reformed Worship. It's number 212 in the book. Number 212 in Psalms and Hymns of Reformed Worship under the section of the book entitled Praise to the Saviour. Now to the Lord a noble song, awake my soul, awake my tongue. Hosanna to the eternal name and all his boundless love proclaim. See where it shines in Jesus' face, the brightest image of his grace. God in the person of his Son, has all his mightiest works outdone. The spacious earth and spreading flood proclaim the wise and powerful God, and thy rich glories from afar sparkle in every rolling star. But in his looks a glory stands, the noblest labour of thy hands, the radiant lustre of his eyes outshines the wonders of the skies. Grace, tis a sweet, a charming theme. My thoughts rejoice at Jesus' name. Let angels dwell upon the sound, and heavens reflect it to the ground. Oh, may I live to reach the place where he unveils his glorious face. There all his beauties to behold and sing his name to harps of gold. Well, let's now turn again to the word of God. I'm going to read from Paul's letter to the Romans, a much-loved, well-known 
chapter, or at least part of it, Romans and chapter 8. And I'm going to begin reading from verse 18. So please turn with me to Romans and chapter 8, and beginning to read from verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall, liber shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Well, how we thank God for such words and for the truth that lies behind them. Well, now let's seek the Lord together in prayer. O oh Lord, we thank thee for giving us thy word, and we thank thee for the words that we have just read. We thank thee, O Lord, for these glorious statements that describe to us the great plan of salvation, predestinated, called, justified, glorified, 
all spoken of as being accomplished. And we thank thee, O God, for the truth of this. We thank thee for that love of thine set upon us from before the world was, that love that planned and ordained a plan of salvation for us, whereby the Son of God would come to be our Redeemer. And we've read of that great advent of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus, the Son of God into the world. We have read how he became a man. We have read how he humbled himself, not coming as a great king in the worldly sense, not coming to dwell in a palace, not attracting great crowds of followers with great armies conquering the world in the way that men would seek to do. But he came born of a virgin, laid in a manger, humbled in a way that is beyond our comprehension. This is the Son of God, the creator of heavens and the earth. And yet he came as a humble being, as a created in a created nature. And, O oh Lord, we bless thee for this. We bless thee for his willingness to come. And it humbles us to think that he would do such a thing. May we learn humility from him. May we be willing for all thy will, whatever that will may be. And we thank thee, O oh God, that while he was here, he taught and he showed his grace and his love and his patience, his long suffering and kindness to multitudes of people. And we think especially of his disciples, how he bore so long with them, their slowness to understand, their reluctance at times to accept the great teachings of his word. The wonderful grace that he showed to them is the same grace that he shows to his believing people today. For we, like his disciples then, are very slow to learn, very slow to take to heart the lessons of thy word and the remonstrations of thy spirit and thy dealings with us from day to day. And yet we thank thee, O Lord, that just as Christ was with his disciples then, so thou art to us today, not casting us off, not becoming impatient with us, not having done with us and seeking out another people, but bearing with us and persisting with us that we might be taught rightly and fully and well and that we might be slowly and gradually moulded and shaped into those people that we're meant to be. But we thank thee, O oh God, that we have the record of the death of our Saviour, this awful death at the hands of wicked men who showed their hatred and their malice and their spite against one who was so perfect and so glorious, so sinless. We thank thee, O Lord, that he willingly gave himself into their hands that he might be crucified. We thank thee, too, that he subjected himself to something worse than that, even to the very wrath of God that was poured out upon him, that wrath that we deserve to receive, that wrath that is our just desert, for we have sinned, we have broken thy laws, we have been the rebels. He was none of those things. He was pure and sinless and perfect. And yet he stood in our place. He bore the penalty that we deserve. And upon the cross there, he experienced the full wrath of God that comes upon sin. O oh Lord, we bless thee that he was so willing to receive such punishment, to endure all that should have come to us, that we who are guilty might be forgiven and that we might be taken away from that place of punishment and instead be given the pardon of our sins and that justifying grace of God whereby we stand before thee even tonight as our faith is in the Lord Jesus, as those who are forgiven and washed and cleansed and counted right and accepted, reconciled unto God, at peace with God. O oh Lord, these are wonderful things, and we thank thee for the assurance and the certainty of it. And we thank thee too, O oh Lord, that our place in heaven is secure, that there is no doubt about this. There can be no doubt, for God has willed that we should be there. Christ has died that we might be there. And all of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
work and conspire together to save us and to keep us and to take us to that place of glory where we shall be with our Lord, with our God, with our Redeemer forever and ever. O oh Lord, we thank thee for all of this. And we thank thee that in the meanwhile, while we're here in this world, groaning and waiting and longing for the redemption of our bodies, that we might be their entire body and soul in the glory, while we're here in this present world, with all the afflictions that we suffer, with all the difficulties that we encounter, with all the trials that come upon us. We thank thee, O Lord, that there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. How can the devil overrule God's will? How can any power stand in the way of God's purpose? And if thy purpose is to redeem us and to perfect us and to take us to glory, then we know that that purpose shall be fulfilled. And so we rest in this. We rest in the fact, O Lord, that thou hast chosen us and redeemed us and that thou wilt glorify us in the end. But help us, O Lord, to not simply express words of appreciation and thanksgiving. Help us that our lives may express that gratitude in real and tangible ways. Help us, as we've asked, to be like our Saviour. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We pray that we might have his same mind, that humble mind, that willing mind, that determined mind to do all that God would have us to do, to be those willing servants of our Lord in this world that is so much in need of a bright and a clear and consistent Christian testimony. O oh Lord, we pray that thou wilt make us thy servants indeed and grant the grace that we need from day to day that we might be so. Some of us might be out in the workplace in the coming days. We ask thee, O oh Lord, to be with us there that in every circumstance, in every experience, in every situation that we may face, oh, may we know that thou art with us. May we lean upon thee and find thee to be a very present help in all that we have to do. For others that are at home and perhaps working from home, Lord, give grace there. Help us that we might be diligent in all our responsibilities and duties. For those who care for young children, we pray for them that they may know grace in bringing up the children in the fear and the knowledge of God. And we pray for the children themselves, that they may be blessed by thy spirit and the knowledge of thy truth, and that early in their lives they may come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. For older friends, perhaps looking back over the years and thinking of those times when they could be busy doing one thing and another in the Lord's service, but now hindered from that because of age and infirmity. O oh Lord, grant them the comfort of thy presence and the assurance that their prayers make such a difference in the work of the gospel. Those prayers are invaluable. And we ask, O oh Lord, that older friends may not lose heart, nor feel that they are beyond serving God or his church, but rather very much involved in the work of the gospel as they present one cause and another one person and another before the throne of grace. So Lord, we all need thee and what need there is and how can we attempt anything or live a day without thy grace? But thou art gracious and full of blessings and we thank thee for that. And we pray that in these coming days, we shall receive from thee everything that we need to be thy loyal people, to be devoted unto our God and to be well-pleasing in thy sight. So keep us, Lord, keep us from the evil one. We know how he prowls around seeking those whom he may devour. We know how cunning he is, how persistent he is. We would not be ignorant of his devices. We would know, O oh Lord, how he wants to undermine our faith and to bring a division between us and our God, to ruin our testimony in one way or another. But Lord, make us alert to his every advance and keep us in the day of trial and temptation. So Lord, we pray for thy church all across the earth. We thank thee that in one place and another, the praises of God arise from earth to heaven. 
and we thank thee that we can join in that chorus of praise ourselves. Lord, receive our worship tonight, accept the praise that we bring, hear the petitions that we present at thy throne of grace. Thou art the mighty God, Jesus Christ is our prophet, he is our priest, and he is our king, and he, we pray that he will command blessings for his people today and in the coming days. So open thy word to us, help us that we may understand its truth, and may its meaning and its application come with power to us. May we be helped, O Lord, in every respect, to know our God, to follow in the footsteps of our Saviour, and to be those people that glorify thee in all that we say, and all that we do, and even in all that we may think. So, Lord, look upon us now, and grant thy blessing as we continue together, and these things we ask in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. I'm going to read uh, another hymn from the hymn book in Psalms and Hymns of Reformed Worship. It's number 139 and version 1, based upon the psalm, of course, of that same number. Number 139 and version 1. Lord, thou hast searched and seen me through. Thine eye commands with piercing view my rising and my resting hours. My heart and flesh and all my powers, my thoughts before they are my own, are to my God distinctly known. Within thy circling power I stand, on every side I find thy hand. Awake, asleep, at home, abroad, thy power surrounds me still, O Lord. Amazing knowledge, vast and great, far as all length and breadth and height. O oh, may these thoughts possess my breast, where'er I rove, where'er I rest, nor let my weaker passions dare consent to sin while thou art there. Could I so false, so faithless prove to quit thy service and thy love? Well, now we come to the word of God for this evening. And please turn with me to the Song of Solomon. And we're going to look at just the last few verses of chapter 6. So please turn with me to the Song of Solomon. And we're going to read the whole of chapter 6, another long chapter. And then we're going to look at verses 10 to 13 together. So let's hear together the word of God. Whither is thy beloved gone, O thou fairest among women? Whither is thy beloved turned aside, that we may seek him with thee? My beloved is gone down into his garden, to the beds of spices, to feed in the gardens, and to gather lilies. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies. Thou art beautiful, O my love, as Terzar, comely as Jerusalem, terrible as an army with banners. Turn away thine eyes from me, for they have overcome me. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Gilead. Thy teeth are as a flock of sheep which go up from the washing, whereof every one beareth twins and there is not one barren among them. As a piece of a pomegranate are thy temples within thy locks. There are threescore queens and fourscore concubines and virgins without number. My love, my undefiled, is but one. She is the only one of her mother. She is the choice one of her that bear her. The daughters saw her and blessed her yea, the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible 
as an army with banners. I went down into the garden of nuts to see the fruits of the valley and to see whether the vine flourished and the pomegranates budded. Or ever I was aware, my soul made me like the chariots of Ami Nadib. Return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon thee. What will ye see in the Shulamite, as it were the company of two armies? Well, as I've repeatedly explained to you and emphasised, this book is a very poetic book, and it does take a bit of unravelling to find the spiritual truth that is there, but it's an inspired book. God has given it to us. And we can see, I trust, as we have worked our way through this book, that it does speak so wonderfully of that love relationship that exists between Christ and his church. The love of Christ, which is eternal towards his people, and the love which then begins to be reciprocated by his people toward him. We love him because he first loved us and saved us from our sins that we might be brought home to him. Well, in the end of chapter five, we have read of how that the, the spouse was approached by her beloved. He came to her dwelling place, was at the door. She was slow in responding, being sluggish in her response. And when she did rise to, to greet him, he had withdrawn and she's gone about the city to search for him. And that search has been protracted. He has not immediately revealed himself to her. And this of course is for very real and very important reasons. And we've seen how that this is really a reflection of how it can be with Christians in every age from time to time, whereby the Lord makes an approach to us. He may desire to speak to us about a certain thing or to lead us on in some certain way. And we are slow to respond to that. We become embroiled with our comforts and we become worldly and distracted from him. And then finally, because of his persistence, we respond and we search for him. We want to be right with him again. We want to know his presence and his grace and his comfort upon our hearts. But it's not always so easy as that. We have to be persistent in our searching. And the more we search, the more Christ can seem to withdraw from us. And this is no accident. And this is no malice on his part. It's there to teach us lessons and to show us what a loss we suffer for ourselves, what harm we do to the gospel cause, and what an insult it is to him and his grace and his wonderful love toward us. When we come toward the end of chapter 6, we read these words, Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. These are words that refer, of course, to the spouse, uh, to the bride-to-be of the beloved one in the Song of Solomon here. But these words, in a spiritual way, have very much to do, of course, as so much of the book, to do with, with a Christian, or to look at it in a more broad sort of way, with the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 10, there's a kind of uh, analogy, almost a little parable that's given to us. You see there, this reference to the morning, and then fair as the moon, and then clear as the sun. This seems to be a reference to a kind of a development that's taking place. You think of the darkness of the night, which gives way to the morning light when the sun begins to rise. And then there is the reference to the moonlight in, in succeeding periods of darkness. And then the full sun that appears at the end. And I would suggest that this has to do with the development 
the progress, the rise, if you like, of a Christian who is recovering or being brought to recover from a dark and poor spiritual state. As the spouse has emerged out of her lethargy, so the Christian emerges out of his or her lethargy, and it's like the, the morning light beginning to appear and a light being shown off by the, the moon in the darkness of the night, and then the full sun appearing, the whole progress of a recovering Christian until such time as God takes that believer home and installs him or her in her heavenly glory. Begins with the darkness, and we can see the darkness of this spouse in this imagery that we have in the book here, the darkness of spiritual sloth. And we perhaps know what that's like when we have been negligent in our spiritual exercises, when we have allowed the world to come in or sin in a particular kind of a way. And we lose our assurance. We lose a sense of peace. And the chastening hand of God will no doubt come upon us if we do not quickly put things right. There's the darkness of that experience and it's a very unpleasant kind of experience indeed. But then the morning comes. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning? The morning begins to dawn, the sun begins to rise. And in the picture here, the sun begins to rise in her. And we've seen in chapter six how she speaks so eloquently and fully and lovingly of her beloved. And there is a hope for her now. She's seeking him and she's in earnest. And she hasn't forgotten the beauty and the wonder of his person. And as she goes about the city, you remember this? She goes about the city, what is thy beloved more than another beloved? And so on and so forth. And she speaks about him. And as she speaks, so she is bringing a kind of morning light to those who hear her. They've been in darkness. They don't know this, this glorious person. But now the light is beginning to dawn upon them. And you can well imagine that this will be the case of a Christian who perhaps has been in a period of this spiritual darkness. But now there's a change coming over him or her. And it's evident the things of God are becoming as they ought to be for her. And she's speaking about her faith. She's speaking about her saviour. And the light that's dawned in her or in us is dawning upon the people to whom we speak and amongst whom we live and move. And it's a wonderful picture. But then there's a reference to the moon, fair as the moon. Well, the moon doesn't dazzle like the sun does, but it does stand out in a dark night sky most prominently. And... Doesn't the Lord stand out to a believer in times of trial and challenge? And doesn't the Christian stand out in a dark world where there is seemingly no knowledge of God and no light of gospel light in that world? But here's the point, it seems to me. The moon, of course, has no light of itself. The moon can only reflect the light that comes upon it from the sun. And the picture surely is that the more fully the moon is exposed to the sun, the brighter the moon becomes. The more fully the believer is exposed to communion with God and with Christ, the more the believer reflects the glory of the Lord in the world and in its darkness of his time. And this, of course, is the all important thing. We have no light of ourselves. We cannot project into the world hope and help that comes from ourselves. We cannot convert the world. But the more near we are to the Lord and the more brightly his light shines upon us and in us, then the more that light is reflected into a world of darkness. And a Christian living in the light of God's grace and in the light of communion with God will reflect so much into the world of our time and how the world needs that. 
Who is this? Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun? This takes us forward. This takes us forward to that time when, after all of the stumbles of life, our falls, our spiritual setbacks, when all of this is over once and for all, when the Lord takes us into the glory that awaits us, this is when we shall be as clear as the sun, when we shall shine out even as the sun itself. While we're here in this world, life will be an experience of stumbles and falls. It's an uneven progress as we make our way through life here in a spiritual sense. But you remember the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. We all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. It's progressive. Sanctification is a progressive matter. We're not suddenly transformed into what we're going to be. It's a gradual thing. But when we do arrive in our heavenly place, we shall be as clear as the sun, not emerging from the gloom, not shining forth in a dark world, but there in all the fullness of the glory of God, clear as the sun itself, just as Christ is, knowing and showing forth the light of that glory that is his in the pure and glorious holiness of heaven itself. So the rise, the progress of the, Christ, the Christian, recovering from periods of darkness and difficulty and emerging from it all, and finally appearing in the glory as clear as the sun. You can think, of course, of this as well as applying in principle to a person who never knew the Lord. Perhaps there is somebody listening to this tonight who has never really known the Lord. And when we don't know the Lord, when Christ is not ours, it's very much like a night of unbelief, a life without God, a life fully in the dark spiritually. And yet, by God's grace, the morning begins to dawn. The glimmer of light begins to appear. The sun of the gospel begins to shine into our hearts. A conviction of sin may make that life even seem darker for a moment, but that has to happen because when the gospel message is proclaimed to us, Christ dying upon Calvary's cross and salvation offered to us through the Lord Jesus Christ, well, we see why it's so important and we see the glory of it all. And the morning begins to appear in our hearts. And then we become as fair as the moon living in this dark world. We become transformed and we begin to reflect the light and the glory of God in the dark world in which we live. And we do so until there is that clarity, that clearness of the sun that comes upon us and shines through us in heaven above, that glory that awaits any and every believer. You can think of this, well, of this as well, thirdly, as applying to the rise and the progress of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a morning. The gospel light began to rise. And as gospel light began to rise, God's church began to emerge. And as the light of the gospel of Christ began to shine more brightly, so the church became more evident in the history of this world. When Adam fell into sin, we have to go right back to that because that's where it all began. When Adam fell into sin, what did God do? He clothed Adam with the skin of an animal, pointing forward to the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. There's the gospel message. And even in Adam, there's the, the first dawnings of the light of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You think of the flood and Noah and his family stepping out into a new environment altogether. And there, if you like, is another 
sort of embryonic view of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you have it again with, with Abram, called from Ur, going forth with his family and being called to go forth into Canaan eventually. And there again is a picture of the gospel and of a church being born. The, the morning light is beginning to dawn more and more brightly across the world. You think of Joseph going down into Egypt and the brothers who joined him there and the great multitude that that uh, that that, uh, that 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 became of, of of the family there over the course of those many years, and then the Exodus, of course, and those hundreds of thousands of Hebrew people redeemed from slavery begin to make their way toward Canaan, and it's again it's a picture of the church that is beginning to emerge and to be established upon earth. You think of Israel at Sinai and the covenant that was formed there. And so we could go on through the history of the people of God in Old Testament ages. David the king and all that he meant and all that he portrayed as ruling over Israel. The prophets who spoke of Christ, all pointing forward to a further dawning of the light that would come across not only Israel, but the whole world. Speaking of a worldwide church that was to come in future days. And then, of course, the one of whom the the prophets spoke so fully and so wonderfully, the bright and morning star appeared. Jesus is spoken of right at the end of the scriptures in the book of the Revelation. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star, the one who would come. And when he came, of course, and when he died and when he rose again, he began by his spirit to introduce a greater measure of the birth of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning? It's the church of Christ beginning to rise and to shine all across the world. And the church has become as fair as the moon in a dark world. The church has shone out by the grace of God in all the unbelief and the superstition and the sin and the unrighteousness of this world the church of Jesus Christ is as fair as the moon attracting attention to the glory of God and the purer that the church is and the more near that the church lives in communion with Christ the better and the clearer that light shines forth in a world of darkness Oh, but it takes you forward, doesn't it, to what is yet to come. Clear as the sun, that's yet to be. The church has never been and never will be altogether perfect and pure in this world. Tragically, it's been subjected to strife within and persecution from without. Error still persists. It did do right from the beginning. The attacks of the enemy of souls, the enemy of God, that comes against the church of Jesus Christ. It's never changed. It's always been manifested in one way and another. Oh, but the church will shine forth clear as the sun in heaven. We can be sure of that. It's to be perfected. You remember the words of the apostle in Ephesians 5, verse 25 and following. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And this is what he goes on to say, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it, that it should be holy and without blemish. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the scene in heaven when finally and fully all of God's redeemed people have been gathered in to that church and there that church stands in all its glory given a holiness from the Lord himself and assembled there before the white throne the great throne of God in purity and holiness shining forth as clear as the sun and then there's this reference to this terrible army. We've had this before in verse four of the chapter. 
where it speaks in term it speaks of the the bride the the, the spouse the believer the church in in her beauty in her loveliness as an army now the analogy changes somewhat where the lord speaks of his church in her light shining forth in one way and another and this seems to be to me a, a picture of this terrible army this great and powerful army this onward march of Christ's church through the world and through the years of the history of this world. The light that shines forth from the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that light do? What does it accomplish? Well, it accomplishes many things. It exposes the ugliness of sin. The light challenges the unbelief of the world and its ways, the superstition the rebellion that's against the Lord. It does so, and it meets in the course of it all, opposition and persecution, and Satan does his utmost to stop the onward march of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But this is a terrible army. It's a powerful army. It's God's army. And the church persists in her life and in her witness until such time as that church appears in glory and in complete and utter triumph. And why will it be triumphant? Because it's God's army and Christ is at the head and Christ cannot fail and therefore neither finally can the church of Christ in spite of all its weaknesses and in spite of all its failings. At the end, it will be as clear as the sun, this terrible army that has accomplished all that God intended for it to do. Well, there's this wonderful picture then of the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. But you remember that these days for the spouse have been difficult days. She has been unfaithful. She's been slovenly. She's been sluggish in her response to the Lord and she's been seeking him now. And he hasn't made it easy for her because these are going to be testing times and deliberately so for her. He's proving her. He wants to increase her faith and to make more stable her love for himself, you see. And at this stage, the spouse is still not fully and finally in communion with her beloved. It doesn't seem to me that that happens until verse 13. So what's going on in verses 11 and 12 in the meantime? Well, the message that is here for us in verses 11 and 12 is that through all of this trying experience, deliberately sent by the Lord, he has not forgotten his people. His love is still very much toward his people. Verse 11 reads like this. This is the Saviour speaking, the beloved of the spouse. I went down into the garden of nuts to see the fruits of the valley and to see whether the vine flourished and the pomegranates budded. So this is, seems to me to be the Lord speaking about such a time when the, the spouse, when the church, when the believer, the errant believer, the errant church had not finally and fully been restored to communion with him. But while this was going on, he went down into the garden. He visited his beloved. He visited his spouse. He visited his church. Not that she might have been conscious of that, but he went down to see her. I went down into the garden, he says, the garden of nuts, to see the fruits of the valley and to see whether the vine flourisheth and the pomegranates budded. This is what has been going on, perhaps unbeknown, as I say, to the spouse. But he's been down to the garden to see her and to watch over her. How is the garden doing? Is the garden flourishing? Have the pomegranates budded? What's happening to the garden? Well, we have a small garden in our home. It's not a, a magnificent parkland or anything particularly to be admired, but 
it does give pleasure just to go out there from time to time and see what's happening, especially at this time of the year. And you go out to see whether the little rose bush that we have, what's going on with that? Are there any signs of any any buds yet? A bit early. But other plants, well, is there budding there? You look at one and another, and you see that uh, one particular plant has seemingly shot up very quickly, and you see the buds appearing, and if you look closely, you can begin to see the, the colors emerging from those buds, and it's a wonderful sight. And you go there because you're concerned and you want to appreciate what's happening in the garden there. And that's the picture here with the Lord and his people. In times of loss, in times of trial, in times of spiritual trial coming out, of times of backsliding and difficulty, and when the Lord seems to withdraw and we find it hard to have communion with him perhaps, what's he doing? Well, he's watching us in love and he's looking for the growth and he's looking for the fruit. He comes to us, perhaps unbeknownst to us. Is faith beginning to flourish? Is love beginning to, 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 to deepen and to become more constant? Are those longings for me more fervent? Is my intention being accomplished? in my beloved people. You see, these are the purposes that he has in all the experiences that we have in our lives. You remember the words of Jesus in John chapter 15, that parable of the vine and the branches. And he says early on in that parable, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Whatever degree of fruit his grace has produced in us thus far, it's his intent that we should produce more fruit. And this is the reason for so many of the experiences that he permits or ordains that should come into our lives. And he visits us, he's watching over us. We may not be conscious of it, but there he is. His eyes are upon us. These are no random uh, events that God permits to come into our lives. These are no acts of spite on his part to get his own back, as it were, on acts of disobedience on our part. No, these are, these are visitations of love. And he sends things and he appoints things and he watches to see whether the fruit is appearing, whether the buds are beginning to show. And there's, in verse 12, a picture of his heart. While all of this is going on, verse 12 reads, Or ever I was aware, my soul made me like the chariots of Ami Nadib. Well, again, poetical language. The chariots of Ami Nadib. What does all of this mean? Well, chariots, of course, were notable for their speed. Ami Nadib. We don't know who Ami Nadib or what Ami Nadib was. It's thought that perhaps he was a renowned chariot driver from somewhere or another. But the, the picture here is quite clear once you begin to, to delve into it. This is the Saviour speaking. I see my beloved. I see my spouse. I see my Christian. I see my church under this trial feeling her guilt, anguishing in her heart, longing after me. And it's almost as though he's saying here, before I realized it, or ever I was aware, before I realized it, my soul was like the chariots of Ami Nadib. My soul was yearning to rush to my beloved, to be with her, to comfort her, to bring an end to this trial, to these difficult times. It's a kind of impatience to relieve his beloved of her fears and of her troubles, to embrace his beloved because his heart is toward her so fervently. You see, Christ deals with us as seems good unto him. Let's change the analogy for the purpose of illustration here from the garden to the father and his child. No father enjoys chastening his child, but he does and he must 
for love's sake. But while that chastening goes on, and it may need to be protracted at times, we know that, and this is how God deals with us. But while that's happening, the father looks down upon his child in a time of difficulty and grief, when he doesn't understand everything, and it's when it's very hard for him to accept the experience he's passing through. Why doesn't my father pick me up and, and so on and so forth? You get the picture, I'm sure. But all the while, he restrains himself from embracing that child. He wants to do it. He can hardly wait for the moment to come when he can pick that child up and hold it and comfort it and reassure it of his love. And this is the picture. Christ sometimes has to deal with us quite harshly and to hold us at a distance and to withdraw from us. But while that's going on, his heart is toward us to lift the heavy hand of trial is his great desire that he may embrace us and comfort and encourage us and end the trial. But first, is the fruit there? Are we responding to the intent of his heart toward us? Are we ready and prepared for the relief that he is longing to give to us? The trial will not be prolonged a moment longer than is absolutely necessary. His heart burns toward us. He longs to take us up in his arms and before long he'll do that in his own good time when everything has been accomplished by him. And you see in verse 13, there's this wonderful picture of a happy reunion at the end of it all. Return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon thee. What will ye see in the Shulamite? As it were, the company of two armies. Again, poetic picture here but beautifully po uh, beautiful poetic representation of the reunion of Christ and his people the Shulamite well the Shulamite is a word that's the feminine equivalent of Solomon and Solomon means peaceful and the idea is here that Solomon puts his own name upon his spouse much like we do in our modern times and Jesus does that Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. And the end of Christ's purposes for us is that we might be at peace with him and know and experience his peace in our own hearts. And this is what this verse is surely about. Return, he says, return, O Shulamite. Return, return that we may look upon thee. Return that we might be reunited. At last, his arms are open. His heart has always been open toward us, but now his heart is open toward us. Return that we may look upon thee. Do you remember back in chapter 2 and verse 14? He says, let me hear thy voice. Now he says, let us look upon thee. He longs to have us back. He longs to see us reunited with us. This is the reunion with the Lord of an errant believer, an errant church, but now back at peace with her Saviour, her Redeemer. That happens in the course of life, but it takes us way beyond this present world and into that world that is to come. And it speaks surely about that final homecoming of all the church of Jesus Christ. This is a theme of triumph of Christ and every single individual believer and the whole church of Christ together. Return, return, O Shulamite. Return, return that we may look upon thee. The final homecoming then of believers, one by one, by one, entering into the joy of the Lord. And it takes you to that great picture at the end of the age when all of the church of Christ will have been gathered in and then taken into the glory of heaven. Let us 
look upon thee. Return that we may look upon thee. I think there of that parable that the Lord taught. You remember, you must remember the prodigal that finally comes home to his father. And you remember one of the things that the father does, puts a ring upon the finger and gives command that the fatted calf be killed, but bring out the best robe for the prodigal. And there's a picture there of, of the son that's come home and, and cleaned up and, and dressed in the best of all clothing. And the father says to his son, now let me look at you. Or you think of a, of a groom at the wedding and the bride comes to stand beside her husband to be. Let me look at you. And this is the church, surely, at the end. Let me behold you. Let me look at you in all the beauty that is not yours, it's been given to you, it's my own beauty that is put upon you, my righteousness, the white robes of righteousness that Christ has prepared for us. And this is the homecoming, the final reunion of people finally and eternally at peace with the Lord in the glory of the heaven that awaits. The verse concludes with this as it were, the company of two armies. Well, what can this mean? Well, one thing it can mean, surely, is that picture of the entire church of the Lord Jesus Christ, from one Old Testament age and then the New Testament age, all brought together the army of Christ, striving against sin, striving against the enemy through the whole history of the world, but now in glory and assembled there in the beauty of holiness and glorious in the sight of God. This is what lies in front of us, dear friends. And it does so by the sheer grace and the mercy of our great God. The love of Christ for his people. How can we not love him? for what he has done for us. Well, now we're going to close the service and I'm going to read a well-known hymn that's in our book, 452, in the Psalms and Hymns of Reformed Worship. The hymn number 452. Love divine, all loves excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure, unbounded love thou art. Visit us with thy salvation, enter every trembling heart. Breathe, O oh, breathe, thy loving spirit into every troubled breast. Let us all in thee inherit, let us find thy promised rest. Take away the love of sinning, Alpha and Omega be. End of faith as its beginning, set our hearts at liberty. Come, Almighty, to deliver, let us all thy life receive. Suddenly return, and never, never more thy temples leave. Thee we would be always blessing, serve thee as thy host above. Pray and praise thee without ceasing. Glory in thy perfect love. Finish then thy new creation. Pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee. Changed from glory into glory till in heaven we take our place. Till we cast our crowns before thee. Lost in wonder love and praise. Let's pray together as we finish our service this evening. O oh Lord, how we thank thee for that grace that has come upon us, that grace that persists with us 
that grace that takes us through life and that grace that will take us into heaven at the last with all spot and stain and blemish gone and gone forever there to be with our Lord there to be in the presence of our God there to sit at the marriage supper of the Lamb O Lord we bless thee for saving grace we bless thee for divine love and we bless thee for all that's in store for every one of thy beloved people so keep us, O God, in the days of this coming week. May thy love possess us. May thy love reign over us. May thy grace sustain us from day to day. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Well, the Lord be with you in the coming days and uh, hope to hold further services next Lord's Day at 11 o'clock and 6.30. And I very much hope you'll be able to join us then. God bless you. <laughs>